Welcome, everybody, to uh, Rodeo Time, the podcast. We've got a great crew in the house. We're going to talk about uh, William Clark Green's uh, favorite job and his worst job. We're going to talk about the big show coming up, Cotton Fest. It's April 19, 20, and 21, and uh, it's in Lubbock, Texas, Cook's Garage. Very inexpensive tickets. BYOB. Huge lineup. Um, I hear Dale Brisby's going to be there. And Which makes it even bigger. Makes it even bigger. So the numbers have quadrupled since I've come on board, people. Mechanical bull riding, mutton busting, goat roping. And I don't know if you guys have been out to Cook's Garage, but maybe the coolest venue that I go to all year. It's pretty awesome. Like, it's set up for everything. Yeah. It's set up. I mean, you can RV out there. You can, you can watch music. They have rodeos. It's got an awesome... Like, I went in and ordered a steak dinner yeah before the show like it's got a restaurant right there um super cool as as a a former road sign thief like oh my gosh that the road signs they have there the collection is insane well and they're just damn fine people too yeah really really great people there as most road sign thieves are <laughs> so, yeah check that out um <laughs> Um, like to thank our sponsors. Like to thank Can Am. Apparently, Will's going to reach out to them about possibly sponsoring the whole event. So you're going to get one, right? Yeah, that's probably the press. They're, they're you're going to get me one. Oh, is that how yeah, that's the, gonna, okay. the winner of the mechanical bull ride gets a free Can Am? Okay, and uh, or you can just donate yours. I just got a text from FeedBuggyCorporate.com, <laughs> which is Can Am, and they they said no. <laughs> <laughs> But maybe next year. Well, maybe you'll win some Bill Grease beef or something like that. Bill Grease beef. Dale, yeah. Um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about cows. I hope you like cows. We're going to hear about the cow operation, heifer programs. So uh, now on to the podcast. We've got in the house today William Clark Green and company. You want to do some introductions? Donut is Donut Day with Dad. So this is my dad, Dr. Green. I'm the patron. Yeah, I'm the father of William Clark Green, and I could not be more proud. And this is my friend Tanaka, business partner slash uh, merch manager, uh, Juan Sanchez. We call him Tanaka. Tanaka. You call him Tanaka? Like he calls himself Tanaka. I what guess. does Tanaka mean? It's uh, My dad started calling me when I was about five years old. Baseball player. Uh, it's just a nickname. His name was Andres. His last name was Tanaka, so they just started calling me that since I played ball when I was little a lot. So, your yeah. dad's name was Tanaka? No, or no, he, one a, of his friends. Baseball yeah, players. baseball player. His his first name was Andres. His last okay. name was Tanaka, so that's where that came from. I got you. Yeah, were you good at baseball? No, <laughs> <It's> terrible. <laughs> did but you I, pl you played though? I did. I did. I did yeah. play. Yeah. Um, how long you been? With Will? Uh, about a year and a half. Okay. About a year and a half, yeah. I was uh, working at a ranch there in eastern Texas, and uh, Will said I work too much. He said, come work with me. I promise you, you won't work as hard as you do at the ranch, so that's why. Has that been true? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. You it, get more been, days off. I get more days off, but yeah. it, it is work, for sure, for sure. <coughs> but it's fine. Yeah. I get to see a lot of stuff, so. Do you mind the how the hours changed? Uh, yes. So it was sun up to sunrise at the ranch. Now it's sunrise. sundown, sundown sun to sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, man, that that would be tough. I'm a morning person, right? Like I like to get up, and you know, by lunchtime, most of my stuff is day is done. I can't imagine, like. Lunchtime, you haven't even started. No, I'm asleep at lunchtime. Yeah. I get, I get, uh, I wake up when it's time to load in, and it's all the way to sunrise. Sun, sunrise. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's changed, but. So, um, what's your favorite part of your new job? Uh, getting to see new places for sure, and the people you meet. I meet a lot of people, uh -huh. so that's one of the good things. And you're. Uh, when you say merch man, you're running, you're running the merch every night at the shows. I am. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm setting up, selling, putting up, 
get going again the next day. Gotcha. One of those deals. Uh, and ordering and designs and yeah. All, yeah. a lot more to it than that, but yeah. Right. Then we added this uh, Bill Grease merch, so that's on top of it. You know. Yeah. That's So it, that's the cattle company. That is. In Eastland. Yes, sir. That's your baby. It's really fun. It's yeah. like, it's a lot more fun than just taking cows to the cell barn, you know? Yeah. Actually branding and, I mean, my place is, I own 80 acres. My uncle owns 80 acres and we have some lease property. So we don't have a, we call it the farm. We never called it the ranch, you know? Um, but I mean, any chance I can get my wife birthday this week. And I was like, I told my dad, I was like, I'm going to Eastland if you want to come. He's like, yeah, I'll meet you there. And we shredded all day yesterday and all my stuff's broken. So we've been working on tractors and skid steers and, and just, uh, yeah, it's just nice to get out there. Very blessed to have the place. Yeah. How, how long has it been in the family? My uh, grandfather was born there, so my great-grandfather bought the land, I believe, in the early 1900s. So, uh, yeah, he was not raised in Brownwood. He was raised in Eastland, Texas. And then before that, my great-grandfather was raised in Brownwood, which is where Tanaka's from. Texas family. Yes, sir. Texas family. Mother's side's from Louisiana. On yeah. that, our grandmother's, or My grandmother's side's from Louisiana side of the family and you guys at some point went to east texas well this is my mom's side of the family so my dad's side's houston beaumont area victoria victoria and beaumont but yeah we i got i guess we moved to tyler in the 70s when you get started working for university of texas yeah and tyler yeah so um you were born where tyler Born in Tyler, and you went all the way to sixth grade. Sixth grade in Tyler, then then down to College Station. Yep, se- seventh grade through senior high school and College Station. I think we talked about this. Where did you live in College Station? We lived multiple places, but our final like resting spot in College Station was Rock Prairie and Highway Six, Wood Creek subdivision. You bet. Mm-hmm. Highway Six, Rock Prairie. Yeah. So uh, south. That that there there wasn't a lot out there then. Right. No. Correct. Except the silk stocking was out back there, out yeah. there. Right. Is that a library? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's an anatomy library. It's anatomy. <laughs> yeah. The dirty saw. Is what and it's not it. there anymore. It's not. No. Thank goodness. Yeah. No. It. Well, college state. The the town grew around it. No oh, man, it's crazy down there. Yeah, spe- it blew up, especially going towards Houston. That's that direction, and the town has blown up. Yeah, Rock Prairie is not the outskirts anymore. No, it was really the last, the last place, and then you had Nantucket. <laughs> now Nantucket's right in the thick of it. So, and then Welburn has grown crazy. I don't crazy. even recognize. I don't even recognize it anymore. Um, yeah, man. I uh, my bank, my um, lawyer, my CPA, they're all down in College Station. Um, yeah, you Aggies like to stick together, don't y'all? <laughs> but, but <laughs> I haven't, I've only like in the last like eight years, I've maybe been through college say, since I left there. I've maybe been through there like three times or stopped there. I've yeah. driven through a few times going to Houston or something, but like stopped in college station, stayed the night, like maybe twice in eight years. So. It's changed so much. I mean, when we were there in middle school and high school, it was an awesome town to be raised in. It really was. The school system was fantastic, and, and it was great because the summer times back then, kids kids didn't go to summer school like they do now, and it was the town was vacant in the summertime. Yeah. And so you kind of had the whole town, and town's a small town without college kids. College kids double the population. So, you know, summer school, school, school uh, you know, when school was in session, it was always kind of, it was always kind of a mess down there, but summertime was just so, I remember being so awesome. There's no traffic ever. There's no one, no one was there. And now it's just crazy all the time. What, um, at what age did you realize you didn't want to go to college station, go to A&M? Mm. Or did you never want to go to A&M? I mean, I didn't want to go to college period. So. But I, your dad being a doctor, that wasn't an option. Well, I, I wanted to cowboy. So. I worked on a ranch outside of uh, Houston that my parents sent me to for disciplinary corrections. No kidding. And uh, it was his name was Mike Donovan. He had a place right next to Brazos Bend State Brazos, Park on the Brazos in River, Needville, Texas. Was he just a friend, or that's what he did? That was my dad's cousin. 
cousin who my dad used to ranch with back when he was a child. And he yeah. continued doing it the rest of his life. And no air conditioner on the Brazos River. And they sent me down there to straighten me out, and I loved it. And so when I – and I, I did it every summer. And, um, and yeah, when I graduated – uh, from high school, I wanted a cowboy. And so I moved up to Amarillo, which my dad was living at the time. And there's a guy up there by, up there by the name of Chris Britton. And dad had got me a job working on this ranch. And so I packed up all my stuff and drove to Amarillo to work on this ranch. And when I met with Chris Britton up there, he was like, man, it's like, I really don't have any work for you. Uh, and I was like, man, I, I got all my stuff in my truck. I came up here to, you know, I came all the way up here to, he's like, well, have you ever heard of a feedlot before? And I was like, no. And he goes, I was like, does it involve cows? He's like, yeah, oh, yeah. He goes, you'll Will, love it. Will Dorado. And three months later, I enrolled in South Plains Junior College. <laughs> yeah. And went to South Plains for a year. Because you didn't love it. It was awful. Yeah. Worst job. I mean, it was the worst. Yeah. Worst ever. I, what were you doing? I was a feed truck driver. Ooh. Scooping bins. Ooh. You seen? You ever heard that? You ever seen your face in a shovel? Reflection in a shovel? I've yeah. seen my reflection in a shovel. I've scooped miles and miles of bins, and that was the wettest, probably the wettest year in Amarillo. So when the feed gets wet, you got to scoop it out. Right, right. It's trash. Cause, sweep the bunks. Yeah, what and they um, call it. and uh, I just it was, I think five a.m. to six p.m. eight eight days on, two days off, uh, no overtime, eight dollars an hour. Damn. I literally woke up, worked. Went to sleep. I was in bed 30 minutes after being home. I, uh, my, my first like real job away from the house to get paid was at a feedlot, Crow Hollow, outside of Headley, Texas. And, um, I was on the processing crew and it was a nighttime gig mm. and it wasn't that long. Um, maybe several weeks in a, one summer, like not, not the whole summer, but, uh, I was like 14 and, uh, <clears throat> my boss was, he wasn't the guy that actually ran the, the, the feed yard. He was contracted. So like, you know, there, I'm, I'm not trying to like, but he, anyways, he was a little bit of uh, he liked alcohol. And so like, I'm 14 years old, so I would have to drive him. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was, it was a graveyard deal, and I'm I'm 14 working nights at a feedlot, and so it wasn't it wasn't something that was my dad. It, the way we got started is I think he had a crew quit, and like me, my brother, my sister, some other kids from school, like we went to go process cattle late one night to get them out of a jam, and then everybody did it for like a night or two, and then I stayed. And so, like, I kind of, like, accidentally got into yeah. it. But anyway, what it did was give me, it's crazy. We talked about this in my Bible study, in our intern Bible study this morning, warehouse Bible study, whatever. But, like, it gave me perspective because it showed me, like, what a crappy job was like. And now I always, like, if I'm having a bad day in here, something goes wrong, it's just like, well, at least I'm not on the graveyard shift at Crow Hollow Feed Yard. Is that what that was for you? Do you ever think I, about it like that? And I, this is not to be like offensive to anybody who works on a feedlot, but I remember I remember getting up one morning, and or I remember getting my check, and I got new shocks on my truck, and it was like two weeks of work to go for just four new shocks on my truck, which I didn't even need. I got conned into getting them. I was just young young kid, and I just remember being like, I'm better than this job, like I can do more than this job. Yeah. This is, this is not that the job is beneath me. It's just like, this can't be, this can't be it. You know? Right. So that was, that was what it did for me. And it was like, also the two jobs that you and I are describing at the feedlot are maybe the least fun jobs. They it have. took the passion out of it. It, it took the cow, it, dude, it took the cowboy out of me. I did, I was like, I need to go to school. Like I need to go to school yeah. and seeing, seeing some of those guys, you know, some of those guys, you know, 50 years old, doing what I was doing and and I was just like you know I just wasn't the future I was wanting I learned what the word monotonous meant and I, I don't mean that just by like like hypothetically like you know like in a grandiose like literally I was so I was in there one night um 
stamping ear tags and changing, you know, like each pin and whatever, like you, you, you freaking get these hot little deals and you put them, you, you heat up these, uh, um, deals to stamp each ear tag. They're super hot and I'm always burning my fingers and I'm just in this room stamping ear tags all night, one night. And this guy was just passing through to get some medicine and he was one of the guys horseback and he, but he was like, yep, you're going to learn the epitome of monotony here. You will learn what that word means. And I didn't know what it meant at the time. I mean, I was 14 years old and you know, after that summer I knew what monotony meant. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that is the, the most monotonous job that you could ever, you know, in sweeping bunks and feeding, it's the same thing. You look at, well, I don't know, like if maybe if you're horseback, there's been people ask me like, should I go? I'm thinking about going to go work. Like if, if you want to put a lot of miles on a horse and learn how to ride and learn how to identify sick cattle, like you could do that job and maybe enjoy it for a season of your life. Well, they broke horses. The Cowboys out there broke horses while they worked. So they right. sat, and that was like, okay, that's kind of that's cool. They work pens, and and that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. But I mean, they didn't want me to do it. You know, they wanted right. me to drive the feed truck because no one else wanted to. And and there was a guy I worked with. I forgot his name, but he wanted to freaking cowboy so bad, uh, so bad. And he was just waiting for the opportunity to, to cowboy with the rest with the other guys and break horses while they do it. And he finally just quit because he just that the feed truck drivers were so hard to find. It was just like you know, to do that job, it was just like, they knew, he, they told him no, he would still do it, and so finally, yeah. he just gave up on it, I'm curious where, where he ended up, but yeah, that job was, for me, was, and I, I'm really curious how, what my life would have turned out, if I'd have gotten that job on that beautiful ranch in Groom, Texas, uh-huh. Chris Britton's place, dang, I don't know if I ever would have left, I yeah. mean, I'm curious what my life would have been like, I don't or, think music, or you, you might have just been. gone to another ranch, yeah, yeah, boy. Had you mm-hmm. left? I mean, I just don't know. Yeah, I just, I'm just, my life, that, that feedlot put my ass in school. And it was, and I didn't think about going to a ranch or doing anything after that feedlot job. And that, and at school is where you picked up a guitar. Well, no, I picked up a guitar in eighth grade. I was, I was writing songs then. Um, I was writing songs in eighth grade, but I mean, my goal was to, I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to run cows. I mean, I, Eastland, running cows in Eastland was always my goal. Uh, yeah. As a kid, I always wanted to turn that operation and turn it into an operation. And, and, uh, it's, you know, you and Bill Grease. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we keep going down the path of what happened after you go to South Plains, I want to know from your dad, did sending him to those, to your cousin's ranch throughout the early part of his life, did that really shape and mold him in disciplinary ways that you wanted it to? Well, Mike, <clears throat> excuse me, Mike Donovan, uh, who is the son of the Donovan uh, family in, on the Brancis River down there, <clears throat> I worked with him when I was 14 and 15 on a ranch that was huge. Uh, it's in Beaumont uh, called La Belle. It means the beautiful in French. Uh, the only thing beautiful out there is the what you see, but there are mosquitoes that are not beautiful. There's alligators. There's water moccasins there's all kinds of you have to chew the air and it (laughs) it's very very (laughs) and i I, we worked hard mike donovan and i became partners uh, because we were both young uneducated you know 14 15 year old and uh, i enjoyed the heck out of that and uh, memories and of course when he grew up a little bit more same age as me he went to his father's ranch on the brazos river <clears throat> and that's where William got it. So there was some connections that were made in my 14 and 15 year uh, a- a- area of growth that uh, allowed me to have William get down there and see what it really was like. Uh, and that's what he mentioned. And I was real pleased that he was down there in good hands. My uh, my first cousin, Mike Donovan, is a fine fella. He has a big, big place. Uh, you can't really have a small place on the Brazos River. And I'd like to digress just a little bit, probably do something wrong here about get out of this line. But I started looking at names of places like Brazos. What's Brazos? Brazos is a name that originally was coined by the immigrants who came uh, initially. And the Spanish were largely who named a lot of Texas cities. And the name of that river has really been shorted 
by what you learn about now in school, the Brazos River. But that's not the original name. The original name, and <clears throat> you just make this my effort to take over this interview right now, was originally very beautiful and tr- powerful and meaningful in so many ways. The original name the Spanish called that river. It goes all the way down to Brazos Port, which is the Gulf of Mexico, and it goes all the way up here into the panhandle and branches. The original name was the Brazos de Dios. And I went, Brazos de Dios. Brazos, what does that mean? When I have a little Spanish background, mostly from high school, I didn't learn it very well, but I said, that sounds like the word God in there. Dios? Uh, Vaya con Dios is the one. That's... So I looked it up. The original name by the Spanish who named it was the Arm of God. Now, why would you name a river the Arm of God? It comes up this far where we are now. Uh, all right, sit. We crossed it today. It's, it's very impressive. When the immigrants would land, predominantly at Galveston, if I can digress some, uh, you can cut this out too if you want, but I think it's fascinating. They traveled along the rivers. Why did they travel along the rivers? Well, they had wagons, they had horses, and they had f- their feet, and they needed to have a supply of water. And the Brazos River was what nurtured the families to get into the inland part of Texas. That's the Brazos de Dios. So it was named properly. But then, of course, as we, as we learn foreign languages in our school teachers, they, they chop off parts that make it simple. So it became the Brazos and it's noteworthy enough to call it just the Brazos. There's Brazos County, there's Brazos Port, there's Brazos in there. But I thought that was very beautiful how it was named. Many of the names in Texas, the counties, the cities, they're flowery with a lot of meaning. But you, if, if, they're, if they're abbreviated more, you don't quite get the whole story. So I enjoyed that, and that helped history. And it certainly helped William develop into something that, I never expected him to be a musician. He loved the guitar. It was a source of solace for him. He could play in his room. Uh, he didn't play it loud. He just played it. And uh, I, I'm very, very proud of him. Uh, but where I was going with, with that was how Texas has helped us in many ways from South Texas to Central Texas, you know, to College Station at AM. Uh, <coughs> All of those, all of those uh, times we spent, they have helped our family enormously. I think it's important to be uh, move a little bit and see some different different views of, of the state. Enough. So yes, he sent me to that ranch to kick my ass because I was big. <laughs> I was big, and there's no air conditioner at the yeah, entire no, place, that's and true. it was summertime in southeast Texas and Meadville, Texas, which is brutal. I, brutal mm-hmm. i can't imagine i loved it i couldn't wait to go back every summer what kind of stuff were you doing man we well he had a he had a lease property down in outside of matagorda called old soul old soul old, old soul 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 something it was an old oil company sun soul sun and, sun oil yes yeah, i think it was sun oil company but there was called the, the it wasn't a town it was just and we'd go down there and, and those those cows were wild I mean, we were yeah. horseback, and there was really there were fences, but there weren't really fences. You right. know what I mean? It's just that like coast that <laughs> coastal deal is just like it's weird, really bizarre. You just kind of st- survival of the fittest throw them down there, and so we did that he had about four thousand acres right there on the Brazos, and I was doing all sorts of stuff. I mean, everything we'd work hey, all Brahma. All we Brahma. uh, this last Monday. I'm usually just I sell stuff at the sale barn once once a year, and I've already sold all my stuff. But I decided to I, I keep heifers, and um, I decided to trim the herd of heifers that I have because the market's so good. I was like, I'm not going to keep as many. So, and and then I decided also that I I wasn't going to feed out as many steers. So I decided I'm going to take five to the sale barn, some heifers and steers, and I also had a bull. Because I'm keeping heifers, I can't keep the bull because, you know, a little bit of inbreeding might happen. So, I'm taking six head to the sale barn, the market's up, finally going to make some money, you know. And so, I, we went Monday, 
Well, Sunday night I get a text from the sale barn owner. He's like, I got a load of some good ones. And I mean some wild, <laughs> some wild bulls caught with a helicopter outside of Archer City. Not ever seen a human. They thought there was 16 head in this big pasture. Turns out to be 22. There's big bulls in there they've ne- they didn't know existed. Wow. And they're like three and four year old big bulls. And uh, so I, I sold those six head of mine and made almost 8000 And you spent sixteen. And then I spent <laughs> seven thousand. And then I spent seven thousand on five of those bulls. Ugh. We and tried uh, first year heifers one year, and we we will never do it again. <clears throat> we what kind of bull did you have though? Well, we it wouldn't matter. It, it, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't the bull. It was keeping them keeping them on our place. Oh, gotcha. It was impossible. <clears throat> well, I it was uh, such it was the worst year ever. And we run seven head, by the way. So, and it was the every every day. If if, if, a, if a heifer gets out, yeah, we're we're driving an hour and a half to get it. And well, why would you have a problem with them getting out? Our fences are bad, and they were wild. I don't know why. When what was the what what why were they why would they keep getting well, and out? You, they had other cows on the other side yeah. of the fence with the bulls. So, see, our we couldn't keep so them like out. our cows. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to. No, no, no. You're but but we feed with uh, with bags, so we're walking around them all the time. We gather with horses, and we I get to because of the intern program, we'll gather them like we'll make up excuses to gather these cows, so I can teach guys how to set up in a pasture. So they're broke to a horse. They're broke to guys walking. So by the time these cows are having these calves, these when these calves come time to wean, like they're broke. They're broke to be around humans, to be around horses. And uh so when we keep those heifers, they that a running off cow will raise a running off calf and vice versa. We we the problem I think was is the neighbor <clears throat> not only has a lot more grass, but they also have a feed truck with a siren on it. Oh yeah, and so we 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 feed with bags. We do not we we do not we never need a horse. We just they go in the they go in our right and we load them up. Ain't no big deal. Like they're our cows, they're used, our cows are gentle. They're they're tame. They're the good. first year the first year heifers we got out of that it was a disaster. So we yours are a little them. too gentle, and then your fences are just weak, and they'll just walk. Our fences over. are weak. Okay. I wouldn't say walk over them, but they were our fences are weak. But we we've got really good fences. Yeah, we do not. We have but, probably have we have terrible fences. Yeah, both of our we've worked on them though. Big pastures have have really good fences, yeah. so. But they're waiting on the fence on the other side. At the end of the day, to get back in, when they hear the yeah, yeah, coming, so. yeah. If they hear us coming, they'll come back to our side and, right. and just my neighbors, my neighbors. Uh, it's just it not. He's threatened to uh, charge me a feed bill because they've stayed a day too long. He's not excited about it. He's just. I can understand if it's bull and you don't want you know, but it's like this. You know, one one or two heifers. I'm saying across. like he's like kind of salty. Yeah. He's just very. But the work not, he, the not work he has is. And I want to split the fence with them to build a brand new fence, and he won't do it. So but it's like, I don't know what you want me to do. You won't fix the <clears> fence. <throat> well, I'm offering to fix the fence, and he's got a super cool ranch hand. Yeah. That calls us and says, "Hey, man, you know, no big deal. Just let you know," and you know. Yeah. So he's been. He's a been bless- He's, he's been, been a blessing, great, yeah. but yeah, it's. If, if the boss man finds out about it, it's he's very mean about it. He's like, you know, if you can't keep fence, if you can't keep cattle in your fence, maybe you shouldn't own cattle. I'm just like, you, you know, he wasn't talking. He we never complained when his cows were on our place for six months. Yeah, you know, and that happened. That happened like it happened six months later, and I told him, I said, hey, if you can't keep cattle in your property, maybe you shouldn't own them. <laughs> yeah. Dang. Yeah, it's just like why, you know, that's that's be neighborly. Up. See, it's not a big deal. Before we, one of my. The fence is to blame. It's not, you know, right. it's like, let's fix it. One of my fences is not good. And so my I have a bull that travels. And um, my my neighbor to the south, like, we, our bulls were, we were constantly on each other. But it did the opposite to us. Like, her and I got, like, became better friends because of it over time, you know. He's not the landowner. He's the lease, He's the leaser, which I don't know if that matters or not. Oh, but. that's why he doesn't want to fix the fence. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because he doesn't own it, and he's, yeah. But I see so if when we 
put a bull out, I always call Lorenzo and say, hey, are y'all bred? Because we will not put a bull out until you're bred because I don't want our bull to. They've got a really nice Angus operation next to us, and gotcha. they've got their own thing. they got a bunch of Wilkes, Wilkes bulls, uh, Wilkes uh, cows and out there, and it's – and it's like, hey, it's the right thing to do. I'm running seven heads. You're running a real operation next door. Like, I don't want my Charlet to go What across. if you just got, like, a badass bull? Well, we do now. That they wouldn't mind. We do now. But still, I don't want to infringe on their operation right. with the bull. I, I, that, but he doesn't. He doesn't. If his bull, his bull jumped across our fence, and we were like, <laughs> it was how, a badass Wilkes bull. And we were like, that's how leave we it. It's fine. By Dude, us. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. My other camp, my other camp. The reason I sold those heifers is because the neighbor's bull gets on my cows and his bull sucks. And and I and I had on on that camp I had this is West Camp I'm talking about now. I had an RA Brown bull which is a ranch west here in Throckmorton that has really good genetics. And so I got this RA Brown bull that I'm going to put out April 1st, but in March my neighbor's bull mm. That I mean, sorry, bull. These guys quote me all the time. A frame, hatchet ass, like just not a good. Anyway, so now I've I literally have these heifers pinned and, up. Give and you, well, I've already sold them, uh, but the new batch. I guess it was all bulls. So I am now looking at heifers, seven weight heifers, that came off of last year's neighbor's bull but you know when they were real young i couldn't really tell well now that they're seven weights i'm like all right that's off of my ra brown bull that's off of the neighbor's bull you can tell yeah because my orange tags we we tag everything from west camp with the orange tag we tag everything walkamoy camp with the white tag and there's half of these orange tags look great half the other half are just they're they're the neighbor's bulls Mm. so the the heifers he had were from the neighbor's bull, which were awesome. <laughs> awesome. But we just couldn't so, keep them in, so we yeah, we got rid of them. Yeah. But and so, were, and also, I don't know if there was some kind of, like, genie. Like, they knew that they were supposed to be on the other side of the fence, right? Like, right. they knew that was their family. I don't, like, it was, we I just could not keep them. I mean, they were, and they were awesome. We wanted to keep yeah. them for, you know, eight yeah, years, you know? Good. Yeah. And, uh, but we just, we just, I was like, man, we have to sell them. We have to get, we have to get. Five year. I, I've just got the reason. So eight, nine years ago, tried to keep some heifers and um, had 10 bred heifers, lost three of them, Cavan. Just, we were in some really thick country. They were Herefords. They disappear into the brush for two days and don't come out. Like it was just really hard to watch them. Plus, I'm rodeoing, I'm going. And um, so I got really off of the bred heifer game. But then recently, I've I've just over the years when you try to go to replace these old cows, open cows, whatever, it's just really hard to find um, affordable, young, good cows, like a three or a four year old cow that's affordable. You know, if you're looking for one or two, it's or three or four. But like if you wanted to find ten, twenty, thirty head, you know, it's like you're just you're gonna have to pay for them, and um. So then I found a Corini bull that we would buck every now and then and got him tested. And I like the genetics of some of my heifers. And I was like, I'm just going to start raising my own, but I'm going to start them on this Corini bull. And that's what, so that's what we started doing. And it's worked out for us because now the market is so crazy. And if you went to go buy a cow, you'd have to, you know, pay a premium. So, um, we love four-year-old bread. I mean, that's pretty much what four or five-year-old bread. I mean, we've Maybe even bread. gone older. We've gone older than that. At their, I mean, but we love we love tame cows, man. The that's, thing, the thing is, though, also it's just like anytime you went would go to buy those cows, like how old are these? Oh, they're going to be anywhere from four to six, and well, they're all seven. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, we have Mike. We have a, a secret weapon, Michael Rab, who is worked cell barns his entire life, hauls cattle, and I don't think anybody knows cattle more than he does. He just, I just, I just tell him that I need five, five cows, and he'll pick me out five great. And they, every one he's gotten us has been great, non problematic. He, <laughs> he does a cell barn. He, he's the one that ages all the cows. So, if you have an in, somebody like that that's really good at cell barn, because guys like me. 
would sell you know, anybody. I'm not not just guys like me, but like like I sold a bull at the that bull I sold. The only reason I sold him is because I was about to start getting into some inbreeding. Really good bull. Yeah. Well, like if you're working at the sale barn, like um, you're gonna see that come through. You're gonna like. The, the guy that owns a sale barn, Ronnie Harden here lately, uh, locally, he knows me. He knows that bull by name. And if you needed a bull, like he's going to call you and say, hey, there's this bull. And now you got him at, at for sure. you know, sale barn price. So, like, if you got an in at the sale barn. But just going to the sale barn, <clears throat> seeing it, and going, oh, like. You, you need know. to have patience. Call your guy, like who you know. Yeah. I need. And, uh, well, he's going to charge you a little. No. Freaking let him have it. Even if he did, he he may not because he's your buddy. Yeah. But I'm saying, like, if you're somebody in the general public, right, 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 it's worth it. Pay yeah, him for sure. Pay him because we've, we've had right, every <laughs> one of our. I, I don't. We've never gotten rid of one. The only reason we did is because we weren't sure that they like they were so broke mouth, and we just weren't. We just like we didn't want to get into problems with it. We just it was like time. it. Man, it was time. But they they were great. They were amazing, amazing cows. It was this new set we got is yeah, great too. too yeah, yeah. They're so, from the same place. And, yeah. and it makes me think back when we were dealing with those first year heifers. It was like, uh, it was just such a cluster. I mean, it was a disaster. Yeah. Every yeah. week there was a new problem, and it's like I'm out. And we, as bad as we wanted to keep them, I was like, I'm out. I sold them to a buddy of mine, and uh, I think we sold them for a thousand dollars a piece. Yeah. And if you're dealing with a lower set of numbers, I don't think there's anything wrong with just buying the. Ca- I mean, I don't think everybody should keep heifers. I just. Yeah, yeah. We d- we had the right kind of bull. No, I wish we could. And we just yeah. don't have a place for it. I mean, yeah. Well, we don't have time either. When we're yeah. on the road, I mean, we we can't like mess. you lost three. Right. I mean, we can't mess watch them. We got to watch them. So yeah. Um. Back to South Plains. We've we've learned about the disciplinary. You go to you go to South Plains. Uh, we learned about what put you there. You went to South Plains, then you went to Tech. How did that play out? Whenever you're just like you transitioned, well, it took from, a, it took six and a half years to play out. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another another six months, and you could have been a doctor yeah. like your old man. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, once I got to Lubbock, I mean, my new addiction, which was it was seriously. I mean, I, I wanted to cowboy so bad back then, and guitar was always this thing I did. But then it became chasing the the pursuit of a career in it, which wasn't really. I just played. I just played all the time. Any gig I could get, any open mic, any anything, anything I could do. Did was there a high study. to when you call it addiction, was there a high to getting paid to do that? No. No, it for me it was um and it still is. It still is this way. For me it's validation of for me it's always been validation like I want to be known as a good songwriter. I want people to go, damn, he was a good song. I don't care about being great. I don't care about being famous or rich or any of that stuff. But for me, it was always like the craft of the song and someone going, man, there just really wasn't anybody like him. That's awesome. He did that. Like, and he did it his own way. He didn't copy anybody. You know, he blazed his own trail, you know, independent the entire time. Like that, that's my chase. Yeah. Like that's I just, the respect is what I like. I mean, I think that's with any profession. I think even with doctors, it's like you want, the respect of being known as a great doctor. I mean, you yeah. know, not the richest, not the sleaziest one, not the nicest house, but like, man, that dude helped out a lot of people, you know, that's what you leave behind. Right. You know, that's for me, it's like, Oh man, like I want to write songs that affect people's day to day to day lives. Maybe that makes it better or makes them think about something or miss someone or, or rethink of something like that's, that's what I want to leave behind. That's what I, that's my passion still is it still is to this day. What was your earliest feel of that, though? Like, what? Where did it happen? Was it like blue light at Lubbock, or like where did you? Where did it really like? Oh man, that was awesome feeling that. I mean, I, my first gig when I was when I moved to Lubbock in two thousand and four, fall of two thousand four, I started playing immediately at this hotel bar called Recovery Room, and I didn't know anybody there. I had one friend that from Tyler that I grew up with that was around, but he didn't have a fake ID, so he couldn't come. But I remember playing and. And, you know, I never played for people in high school or anything, really. I didn't play. I wasn't, like, on the tailgate playing drinking songs or at parties. Like, no one really knew I played that much in high school. It was a private thing for me. Uh-huh. And so when I got to college, like, all these people were like, damn, he's pretty good. Like, yeah. you know, and I think I think it's 
I think that's what made me pursue it so hard was because it was really the only thing in life that I'd been complimented on in a genuine way. Like I was always the worst player on the all-star team. I mean, I was good enough to make the all-star team, but I was always the worst player. I was C student since like sixth grade, you know, a uh, terrible cowboy. That's why they put me on a feed truck, you know, like it's, but that, but that was like, people were like genuinely like, damn, Hey, that was a good song. Hey, we play that song you played last week. That that was a good song, you know. Or hey, can you uh, play that Ray LaMontagne song or or play that Steve Earle song? Play that Rob. Like people, a genuine want to hear me, which was that was where the addiction festered so much. It's like I was, you know, it's like when people in the military they come back from, you know, they're very important people in the military and they transition into civilian life. Well, they're not important people anymore, you know. But in the in in wartime or in the military, they're they're needed, they're they're wanted, they're they're the professionals at what they do, and then they the, the transition in civilian life's really tough, you know. Yeah, I think that's what I loved it so much because it was like this thing people wanted, you know. It seems like to be successful mm-hmm. with that, and by success, I mean not the amount of money, but the ability to use it as a way to make money like you've got to enjoy and or be good at a lot of different things actually playing guitar singing the music writing the music deciding where to go how often to go there how much to charge then there's apparel then you got to manage your band you got to get along with them at what point did you, is that true? And at what point did you realize you were going to have to do all of that? It's, it is such a slow process. I mean, it took, we were in a truck for two years <coughs> before we got in a van and we were in a van for six years before we got in a bus. And it's just all grown so slowly. You don't even think about it, but yeah, it's managing employees is difficult. Uh, <coughs> paying, paying employees. I mean, we're, my guys are pretty much everyone's on salary. Like, you know, it's, we run a there's there's twelve of us on the road and there's five of us that, that stay at home you know and work from home, and and it all comes from one source and that is a it is literally from a song that has to be written, yeah and that's that's the pressure is if you don't write good songs you don't have that stuff, period. Yeah. It, it can just, go away. It can go away like that. I mean, it can go away like that. It can it can grow like that. It can stay stagnant like that. It can. There's all sorts of variables, but I, the success success part in the bus was never a deal. It was I was gonna write songs and record music no matter what I did in life. I, I always wanted to do it, so I just got lucky. I just got lucky enough to where it, when I turned 28, 29, when I started having to make really serious decisions about my life path, uh, I was making enough money for me to continue pursuing it, and that's the only reason I continued to pursue it because. I, t- I told myself I was not going to be a 50-year-old on a bar stool at a juke joint. It's just not going to happen. It's just, I just want, I want more out of life. I want better. I want to have a family. I don't want to live in a bar until I'm yeah. 60 years old. You know, I just don't want to do that. So, <clears throat> I, um, yeah, I, I kind of put give myself goals. And, and, you know, now that I have a family, I'm married with a kid, like some of those goals have to be money-based. You know, we need right. to do this to afford <laughs> To live, I have responsibility now, which I before I had was married, had a kid. It really didn't matter. Like when COVID hit, I was like, I was like, I mean, I've been poor before, I'll be poor again. Like I know yeah. how to do it, so it ain't a big deal. So I, uh, I'm not saying you and I are on the same level. I do think there are similarities in what you and I do. Meaning, oh, of course, meaning like there's a lot of pressure on the back of our creativity. Well, it's entertainment. Correct. We're selling entertainment. Yeah. So, cause somebody will say like, um, just that they would address the longevity of what I'm doing. And I think in my mind, know. it depends on, um, uh, yeah, some people are for it. Some people are, some people think that it, it, it can go on a long time. Some people think that it can't. And my answer to that, is that it, it It depends on, you know, they will be interested if I'm interesting. So I've got to continue to entertain, like you said, 
a.k.a. bring value. And so long as I can continue to do that, then I think I'll continue to be relevant. The Whenever I stop being entertaining or interesting to people, then I'll no longer be relevant. And that's when it'll be the beginning of the end. And well, yeah. so that means I've got to constantly put their needs before mine. You, you have to care. And that's the one thing about music business is once song singer songwriters stop caring, it's so obvious. It's just so obvious. And, uh, you know, if I listen to people, I'd, I'd have a boring life. <clears throat> so I'm very glad I didn't. I, uh, what's it look like? I didn't listen it? to my dad and no offense to him, but he, dad called a starvation box and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, he wasn't wrong. It just got to, you know, and I'm, I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones. I mean, I, I was able to make enough money to, to keep surviving, but, um, there's, yeah, I didn't listen to anybody. What, I just it, did it. What's it look like when a singer songwriter stops caring? Like, how is it obvious? Uh, the main thing for me is they stop caring about their band. They stop investing in their band. I think that's the first pin that falls. They care more about the immediate, the extra 500 bucks or extra thousand dollars for a gig. And as opposed to like keeping a band and keeping a talented band. I mean, one of the, my biggest strengths is I, I take care of my band financially the best I can. And they know that. And, uh, they get, I mean, they get 10 shows a month, a minimum for what they get paid, whether we play, we took two months off this year. So they get paid no matter what. And, you know, we go on a big 10 week tour every fall, but typically they work Friday, Saturday night and they get to go home. They get four or five days off a week, you know, and I invest in that when the first, when people stop caring, they go up, oh, we're going to stop doing that 10. We're going to stop the salary deal. You're going to get per show basis. Oh, you can't play this gig. Don't worry. Someone else can do it. And then you just send them the music and they show up to the gig and they're not prepared. And now the gig sounds like trash. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's the that's the first indication when band members when they stop caring about who they're playing with on stage. It's extremely important. Do you have something you want to say, Dad? Well, there's a philosophy from <clears throat> Shakespeare that I tend to summarize uh, what effort you may be trying to s uh, express, and I'm interpreting what I think you're trying to say. And Shakespeare, I think, said things best. And brief was how he said things, even though he had difficult plays to read when I was in high school. And I can remember this one as you're speaking. And it's about music. And it says, or he says, and I don't remember which play it's from. I'm a little negligent on my knowledge of Shakespearean history. But he said, or he quoted that music has magic that soothes the savage beast. And I remember hearing that as a teenager, and I went, what, what savage beast? I'm not a savage beast, but I like music. So maybe the music is soothing, soothing the savage beast in me. I, I thought of that, and that's the value of trying to become literate. I was very blessed to have be from a big family with five males. And three were liberal arts majors. Which I thought, oh, liberal arts, I don't know. That doesn't sound like anything for me. But they were great at expressing Shakespearean thought and uh, going with the wind and various, various factors that they, they all studied in English, and many of them became attorneys. But I didn't. I ended up moving into a science mode, which I wanted to get to the answer, if that's possible. It's not always possible, but it's it requires hard work. But I like the quote. I still used it in many in many experiences, and that is, "Music hath magic to soothe the savage beast." Yeah, I like that. It's intriguing, <clears throat> like you said. Of you don't want to be considered as a beast, but well, <laughs> I have some. My wife could explain me. <laughs> my my boots Poor have mom. beast beast have evidence of beast in the boot in the shoots, <laughs> in, the, yeah. in, in the boots and in the. You can't wear that. In fact, I did not know that I was going to be photographed, and I have this shirt that I got when I was at A and M. It was the George Bush President's George Bush Library that he built there, and I like it. And people think I'm. Are you with the president's staff? Well, he's not 
a round. I don't think anybody's <laughs> looking at you right now. I'm thinking <laughs> so, what the president said. I, I like this. I like it's blue jean. I like. <laughs> He's ready to go work. Enough, <laughs> enough comedy. Yeah. How um, you don't want to be the fifty year old playing in the bar. So what do you want to be doing when you're fifty? I'm mean, out be doing with some what I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, my my goal would be theater gigs would be awesome, you know. Um, but who knows? I mean, life's crazy. I mean, like I said, this is this is something that can, like you said, be gone in two seconds. And, and right, the good thing fragile. is fragile. It's fragile, but it's also like my entire identity doesn't rely on it. Like, man, uh, there's a lot of there could be. You know, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. Um, if if my, let's just say my voice went out tomorrow, man, there'd be a lot of things I look forward to. I'd look forward to reuniting with my friends on the weekends. Yeah, you know, I'd look forward to uh, uh, well, I mean, duck hunting with my buddies and yeah. all the things everyone does on weekends. And but the, you know, I I do enjoy you know my, me and my wife's weekends are Sunday, Monday, Tuesday you know, Wednesday pretty much. And, and, uh, and dude, there's no traffic. There's no lines at the grocery yeah. store. There's no nothing. If you had to get a <laughs> job right now outside of music, what would it be? Or, or in music, but just not, you're, you're not, you're not getting paid to be William Clark Green anymore. You're going to get paid a salary. What, if what I, would, if I could do something, if I, if I had the decision to do it, I mean, I would, I really love working on, I would love to get more educated in working on tractors and stuff like that. Like really, one of my dear friends in Eastland, his name's Ken Rourke. He's like John to, Deere, he works at Deere. Uh, oh, D E A R. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> that caught you off guard a little. It really it? did. I was yeah. Uh, well, he owned, he owned a he owned a place called Tritex in Cisco, and he sold me a couple tractors, and and one tractor he sold me the engine blew. And, uh, and it was, he calls it tired iron, but it was a MF 65 Massey Ferguson four cylinder Perkins diesel. And, uh, and I brought it back to him. I was like, Hey, this engine blew up. He was like, well, you bought an old tractor. And I was like, well, yeah, but I mean, I've had it for two weeks. He's like, all right, we'll bring it by the house. We'll look at it. And, and, and shoot, we'd send up, we'd drink beer and we took the whole tractor part, rebuilt the motor together. And that's fun for me. Really? Like, yeah. So much fun. That makes me cringe. Yeah. I love it. Putting a tractor together, gross. So fun. Um, I would love for the beef thing to, to become some sort of income that's probably not the main source, but it would be awesome to do that. That would be great. I think that's more of a, this is kind of a, it's just fun. Clearing land and growing mesquite. Yeah, but we've been we've been shredding and, and messing with the land, and I love that. I love the getting on the equipment and doing do, that stuff. Do you see yourself... Um, do you see yourself trying to be a number one as in like being an entrepreneur and starting like a land clearing thing or a, a mechanic shop? Or do you see yourself being a number two somewhere or three or four or five? Uh, or? I can't have a boss. If that's what you're asking. Yeah. I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah. So I couldn't, you, I couldn't deal with me. Yeah. No, no, I can't do it. I can't, not after doing this for some, I mean, I've been the boss since I was 22 years old, you know, when I first started taking this seriously and uh, yeah, I would be, I mean, over COVID, I, would, I had no problem getting on my skid steer and going clearing someone's land or mowing or doing something like that, you know. How old are you now? 36, about to turn 37. Um, yeah, so almost 15 years being your own boss. Mm -hmm. And that's when you left the feed yard? No, I left the feed yard in 2004, and I went to college. But I didn't. I don't consider taking music seriously until I started the band and had my first record, and that was 2008. So for the first three years, I was just playing in bars, just playing. No, no CD, no nothing. That seems playing. pretty serious to me. It's serious <laughs> enough. If you ended up with a band and now you're on a bus, like that would that, that those years were serious. Oh, were for sure, for sure. And I, you know, but yeah, I don't, I didn't take, I don't take consideration of my career starting until my first record came. Gotcha. Out. Yeah. Um. Yeah, a lot of people just kind of when they talk to me. They talk to me as if I don't realize how fragile it is. Like, like I always talk about this one ag teacher because I go to a, I go to a lot of the state conventions, and I was at Texas FFA convention when this particular ag teacher 
came up to me. I don't know that he realized my dad was an ag teacher and that I had been bouncing around that state convention since I was a since I could walk, and um, now I just happened to be there, you know, with a a booth called Rodeo Time. And anyway, he was like, he just came up and, uh, whoa, what you gonna do if all this ends? And me remembering back immediately. I remembered back to just my dad not getting along with maybe a new superintendent for whatever reason. And uh, so I just, like, I fired back. I was like, what are you going to do if your job ends? Right. Like, the superintendent could walk in and fire you tomorrow. 100%. My dad was an ag teacher. Like, I mean, if anything, I'm my own boss. My job is more secure than yours, you know, like. You could say the wrong thing to a kid and get fired an hour later. Yeah. And um, anyways, I was a little defensive on that front. But also, I didn't like that he said it as if I were arrogant enough to think that, like, I'm set for the next 20 years. Right. I right. didn't like that he made that assumption about me. Because right. I am i don't. Like, I, I don't take my job for granted. Like, I'm sure you don't. No. And I understand that. It's just like in... in uh, gladiator whenever the 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 slave owner guy at the end is telling uh maximus he's like you got to win over the mob and 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 in the heights of our careers that's what we've done we've won over the mob and at some point we could piss them off for sure and they could throw us off the stage you know and um but essentially what i was going to say my answer to that would be like yes would it hurt absolutely the most painful thing would be not being able to have these employees that are my family now. That would be the most painful part. Eventually, after I got over that pain, I would be pretty happy because the happiest I've been was the job I had right before this one, which was doctoring yearlings, living in my sister's office, making $12 an hour, riding my own horses. And I'm not saying I would go back to that exactly, but, like, I was pretty damn happy then. Right. And just like you said, you've been broke before. So, But, see, the difference for me is it wouldn't hurt my feelings at all if it ended tomorrow. Because the music business the music business is riddled with the most backdoor, dishonest, stupid idiots. Running. But there, there would probably be some people in of the course. industry that you would of course miss seeing. Of, of course for sure 100 percent. but I, I always take it like you know everything happens for a reason this is my path it's my path like i'm not gonna sit there and cry and crocodile tears about it. of course i'd miss certain aspects about it but you know like i said also there'd also be a lot to gain from not doing it as well i think that i would st- if I could still sing and for somehow could not tour, I would still make records. And my, there's three things that I love about what I do. And that three things only really is I love to write songs. I love to record songs and I love to sing songs on stage with my band. That's, that's the three most awesome things that can, that that's the fulfillment comes from that. Everything else is just, I don't like. Yeah. Dang. I mean, I guess like hanging with the guys on the bus, like that's different, but like dealing with, I'm sure you like, I'm sure you enjoy interaction with the fans. For sure. For sure. There are, I I, I say that too. I say that way too point blank, but yeah, there's, but you're, you're, I've been scorned by so many bad things that have happened. I mean, it's just there. It's, it's just, it's, 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 it's literally is a a rodeo. I mean, it's literally, it's like somebody gets you to come play, at their gig or whatever, and you send them a contract, and it's like, why don't we have a contract? Like, man, if you only knew how many times, if you, I wish I didn't have to have a contract. Yeah, well, it's know? yeah, it's or well, or just that conversation, like yeah. it's, um, yeah, I, uh, I think the thing that are you going to be at Tulsa FFA convention by the way, the Oklahoma Oklahoma? Yeah. Yes, I'll you playing there? Yeah. Well, that is there. a big crap. That that one. Has the most mullets. <laughs> Are you gonna do one for it? 
I'll do. So, I'm not on stage, but like I go to California convention and like I host like their mullet contest. They give away a trophy. Will now. you please intro us when we before you play at the Tulsa one? Oh yeah, I'm well, sure. Well, I, I guess will. They, they do all sorts of stuff before they have. To nobody have. They may have a state before. officer that's yeah, like a how they do that. diehard William Clark Green fan. He's you know one of the seven. <laughs> And uh, yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. And uh, but but anyway, if if they don't they just play it by ear, if they yeah. if they don't, I'd love to if yeah. they don't want to, but um, yeah. So at that convention, dude, just mark my words, so many mullets, okay, way more. Like California has a few and enough to have a contest, Texas has some. We'll go to a national convention this year, we're going to Florida. But um, but Oklahoma, if five kids walk up, four of them have mullets. Wow. And two of them will not be small. I mean, like, past the shoulders, permed, shaved on the side. It's crazy. And they're starting to put those lines in the side now. Oh, I've yeah. seen that, too. There's little variations yeah. of it. And uh, anyhow, I forgot what we were talking about. I mean, you go yeah, back and look that. at Billy Ray Cyrus and how much, like, when we were growing up, how much <laughs> we made fun of those haircuts. And how they are so back right now. Yeah, when we were coming They're not up, even, like, people started doing the mullets to be funny, and now they're like, no, it's a serious haircut now. That's what I know. Yeah, it is a real deal. So, you should shave you one just for that show. <laughs> Maybe he's, I'll let you do it on he's stage. He's thinking about Maybe it. Maybe I'll let you do oh it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Before we start this show... <laughs> I've got to do something, y'all. Dale Brisby, <laughs> walk out there and put one of the deals around your neck. I'm telling you, that place would go crazy. Oh, for sure. They would, the top would blow off of that building if you cut yourself a mullet on stage. Wow, it really would. My goal is one day I'd like to go on Theo Vaughn, and I want to, like, during the Theo Vaughn podcast, I would like to have some a barber come out and cut me a, a more... More precise mullet <laughs> than what I have. People, some people think I have one now, but you know, it's not. It's not a true mullet. But then, if I were to ever cut one, it would have to be in- Theo Vaughn's the com- comedian. Yeah, that was on Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, he goes on there all the time. He's stand up comedian. He's from Louisiana. Yeah, the same guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's got that Southern boy in him. Yeah, for sure. So, anyways, what 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 do you have coming up? Cotton Fest. That's what I know. Yeah. April. What? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were looking at me. It's, like, uh, it's the second. It's the second to last weekend in April. I think it's. Oh, it's 420. It's uh, yeah, April 20th and 21st. And then the VIP events on the uh, 19th. Gotcha. So. Yeah. The third ish weekend in April. Um, that's when. I'm going to go see my grandma. That means I get to see my grandmother like two or three times. Her birthday's in the first week, then I'll go see her. In the oh, is it really? Week. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, April 6th. Well, thank you for coming this year. 7th. Yeah. Yeah, it's I'm the mechanical excited. bull ride, I think, is going to be a, I think it's going to be a bigger hit this year. It was a yeah. big hit last year, but I think it's, I don't think people really knew what to do, and I think this year they're going to be looking forward to it more. Yeah. So. It's a thing. It's a thing. Mechanical bull. Some guys are making the rounds. Also, the goat roping. And is that? I mean, you can't skip that now. Gosh dang, that sucker went all day last year. Oh man, they raised like two thousand dollars for the high cotton relief fund doing that. And then we're also doing mutton busting this year too. So I'm excited, really excited about that. We're gonna try to get fifty entries. I don't know if that's. I don't know if that's. Uh, How many times can I enter? The mutton uh, busting. Yeah. Well, you'll be DJing it. So. Oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um. Yeah, we're trying to get fifty entries and. Uh, who all you got playing? Uh, so we got, uh, I can give you the exact lineup right here. Uh, Friday night, Shenandoah, Kevin Fowler, Ken Fo. I think Ken Fo's on Friday night as well. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on the nights. So Shenandoah, Kevin Fowler, Grady Spencer, Caitlin Butts, Carson Jeffrey, and Ken Fo are on Friday night. So I can't, honestly, I think Caitlin Butts has the best female record out this year. I think her yeah. record's phenomenal. Yeah. And then Shenandoah is, I'm such a fan. So I'm excited about that. Uh, Carson's awesome. Grady Spencer had been listening for years. And K Fowl, I mean, dude, that's still not beer bait anymore. Kenfo is a band a lot of people in West Texas don't know about yet, but they're from San Antonio area, area and they are 
bad ass. Like yeah. Charlie, like a Mexican Charlie Daniels is yeah. how I would describe them. Dang. It is awesome. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, Saturday nights, William Clark Green, me, Reed Southall Band, Cody West, Tyler Halverson, and Mason Lively. Lively. So, um, yeah, it's going to be fun. What? Uh, it's at Cook's Garage again, mm-hmm. which is uh, south side of Lubbock. Um, what's attendance like? Like, do you know numbers? Ten thousand every year come to the gates. So that's, that's Friday. That's Friday people. and Saturday night. So, um, yeah, we do about four, three or four hundred for the VIP event. Which, th- what's really cool about the VIP event is we have a we have for your listeners is we have a foundation called the High Cotton Relief Fund. And so all the money raised on Thursday night at the VIP event, we're going to have a band and then we're having a casino night. We do a live auction and silent auction. And all the money that's raised goes to a fund called the High Cotton Relief Fund. And what the High Cotton Relief Fund does is it, it surrounds the, co- co- the cotton and farming community around Lubbock, Texas. And so we've helped out a bunch of, in a bunch of different situations, but the reason it started was when a farmer dies during stripping season and everyone – around the community comes and helps their family out and strips their cotton for free. We'll send a diesel truck full of diesel and fill up everybody's tractors. Yeah. And it's, we do that religiously. If it ever, ever happens, that's like the main focus. It's, 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 we have these different wagon wheel spokes that have come off. We've helped, we paid for funerals. We paid for, uh, hospital bills and we, we yeah. keep it private. We don't talk. We don't, we don't, so yeah, we don't that, make them poster childs right. or anything like that. So if yeah. if you if you're curious about where the money's going, just ask around. I'm sure there are people what people know. Terrible. About it, so. Hey, Debbie, <laughs> um, can I get you to do this interview? Yeah, I know we just finished the 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 funeral, but uh, we'd really like to promote to help promote how awesome I am. <laughs> like you know, like and how good of a job. Like hey. you know. Um, it's just, I'm going to need you to do that again. You didn't say high cotton relief. Yeah. Fund. And <laughs> can you please cry more to really send it home? It's like, yeah, that oh. is not, that's not what we're doing. That's not our intent. And, and the one thing I want to make sure is I'm not for sure. I'm not hundred percent sure on our, our main percentage yet, but like it's in the 90 percentile. I don't know if it's 98 or 92%, but 90 percent ish of our money actually goes to victims. It's not going to paying me or anybody to run yeah. it or accountants or any of that crap. Right, right, it's right. going directly. The money that's going in is going directly out. Yeah. And so of course there are some expenses. Like we have a golf tournament, the Monday of cotton fest, we had to buy a $7,000 golf cart, but that golf cart's going to raise right. 10,000 or 15,000, hopefully more than that. So, yeah. Um, and, uh, so we're, we're, you we're, give away a golf cart. Well, it's so we're at the golf tournament. We have a hole in one for a skid steer, brand new skid steer. We have a hole in one. Oh, they're prizes for people. But the, but the golf cart we had to actually pay for hole in one for a brand new Kubota cabin air tractor, hundred horse. And then for $50 a ball closest to the pin wins that golf cart. Right. So, but I'm saying it's not like it's at your house. No, <laughs> I mean, I might drive it that day. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, Dang. Well, and then you're giving away a Can Am for the mechanical bull riding winner, right? No. <laughs> Let's get with Can Am and no. see if we can't park a brand new Can Am out there, at Cotton Fest for all those mechanical bull yeah. riders. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll give you an email, <laughs> and you can have your people get with their people. Okay, cool. But make sure you do not say my name. <laughs> um. <clears throat> No, there's no telling. They would probably do something like that. They talked about wanting to get into music. Well, when are you going to do a Newcastle Music Festival, Del Brisby Music Festival here? Well, I need to. I need to have somebody come play my deal here. Well, I live down the road. You want to do it again? I'll do it again, dude. You helped me out so much. I'll do. It. You say jump how high? You pay. You tried to pay me last time, and I ripped that check up. Yeah. I want you at Cotton Fest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, I'll happily do it. But I think I th- if you want to sit down after this, we should literally talk about doing. And the thing about music festivals is you can start small and cheap. You don't have to make it this grandiose, expensive deal. Like, just start small. Start it with three guys on the acoustic guitar and and a barbecue cook off. Right. Make it cheap. Make it fun. Make it communal. You know, 
And we could totally talk about doing that here. That'd be I think that'd be really cool. Well, I would like to make it um, fest. a longer thing during the day. Like like just like more of a day. So like um when you played somebody open for you and then you played and then it was kinda over and um more like start at one, uh, maybe have like free hot dogs for however long and then, you know, like have two, three, four people play. Yeah. Is kind of my and then if people, you know, wanted to show up right before you played, that's that's great. But like if if um you know, it, it maybe it ended by like six o'clock. Well then people are here for five hours. Yeah. Would it be worth it for me to get like a a liquor license and, and all that and sell booze? Sell booze. I think I'm a big fan of BYOB like cotton fish. I think people love the fact they can bring a cooler whatever they want and just do whatever they want. Um, I, uh, I'm a big fan of BYOB. So you just make money on the ticket itself. Ticket, and we do a cooler charge. It's like 10 or 15 bucks uh, for a cooler charge, and your cooler can be any size. See, I don't, I personally don't drink, and so, like, I've just kind of not addressed it at all, and it's not really a problem until it becomes a problem, meaning, like, if someone were You can to- make a lot more money selling, getting Bud Light to come in and sell cans of beer at 9 or $10 a beer, that's how the festivals do it. The reason what separates Cotton Fest <laughs> away from all those other ones is you can buy uh, the tickets cheap and you bring your own beer. It's a cheap. It's cheap. Why not go? You know, like uh-huh. even if you're on the fence, like most people, are like oh, it's eight dollars a beer and tickets are forty dollars and like I'm gonna freaking drink five beers and spend it. Like no, it's like no. You can load up a cooler with what however you can pack in it and the tickets are. I think day t- day passes are thirty five dollars, and for the weekend is like for Friday Saturday is like fifty five. I think, so dude, I mean, talk about the cheapest. Bar. I mean, you can't even do that in a bar on yeah. a Friday night, you know. So bring your camper. I mean, that's a huge. People love being able to bring their camper and bring their kids, and you don't have to leave. And you know, we have a big Uber line and all that stuff. And yeah, it's just it's just, why would you not go? You know, it's right, like if right. unless the weather's crap, you know, which last year, woo. That Friday night. Were you there on Friday night last oh, year? Oh, yeah. The dust storm? Oh, yeah. I was there the whole time. That was crazy. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so my deal is like, I I just, my, my only deal is my apparel line. You know, like rodeo time apparel is like my thing. And so it, when people come in, it, you know, it, it helps brand and then, Obviously, if they were to actually purchase a shirt, that's a plus. So, like, the the only few times that we've had things here, we didn't even charge people to come in. Yeah. So, we sold, like, waters for a dollar, but then we had, you know, just all the apparel. So, like, the whole time people are in watching the, so, like. I mean, I would do, if I had a cool backdrop downtown Newcastle somewhere, uh-huh. bring in a stage, set all your merch up in this big horseshoe thing and have vendors and just make it a day, day fun party. Yeah. yeah. Well, parties. we have the park, but it's kind of small. So the, the key with festivals, start cheap, start small. Yeah. Don't overextend yourself. You'd rather, you'd rather have too many people and be underprepared and improve on that than have way too much stuff, way too much overhead and completely because and the weather comes in and you I mean, you can, it gets real expensive real fast, and you can lose a lot of money really quickly. I'll uh, probably I'll I'll do another day thing, and go from there. We'll see how that. Well, plays if you out. need if you're ever need any help with planning or getting that stuff organized or any kind of lessons that we have learned, I mean, be happy to help. Yeah. So and 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 obviously free just advice or I would happy to happily show up a couple days before and, and just help you. Hey, I think this is a good idea. This is a bad idea because we've seen it. We've seen every poorly ran festival, and we've seen every real real ran festival i hope my festival is a real, real well ran one i hope yeah. i hope people think that uh we we work really hard to try to make it that way yeah so sweet well look out for cotton fest it's coming soon um the 19th 20 21st of april and uh sounds like you get to hear some some good music lined up and we're gonna have merch there dad you gonna be there i will be there it goes every year you better you better have vip seating Oh, yeah. Well, he goes out, my good friend. Well, I'll wander into the ground. My good friend from New Home, <laughs> Texas, is a cotton farmer. Yeah. And so he takes Dad out and the, the, uh, drives the cotton stripper and Biggest. shows him all of his equipment and all that stuff. Yeah. And so Dad loves it. So I couldn't believe how big that machine is. Yeah, <laughs> sounds so exciting. 
you get yeah. next to it. It's <laughs> what is it? It's not a lawnmower. See, that's where <laughs> me and my dad. I'm of my father's son. Like, <clears throat> I do. I do love the cow, cattle part of it, but for me, it's like it's the equipment to like working on the land, improving the land. That's I love doing that stuff. Right. I love it. Yeah, yeah. not me. <laughs> yeah, I love. I it. like being horseback. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but I can I can see how I mean like. Yeah, it takes it takes a village. I get it. Like everybody want you know has their different niche. I guess so. Um, well, good deal. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, well, we you, we re- we usually wrap up with life advice. Okay. So just kind of a one liner. Dad, you want to start? You want to start this off? My advice. Uh, probably not a good 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 thing, but I. <clears throat> I'm concerned about what happens to young people, children. Oh, not children, but but adolescents, young adults. And this is not going to be very pleasant to everyone. But I'm I'm concerned about how our culture is attacking sobriety. Let me try to help you with that. Sobriety means being sober. <clears throat> that's what it means. And a lot of the medications and the drugs that are used, they attack sobriety. We can probably get mad at me for this, but no. I, I, this is really dangerous to have our youngest minds that are going to be in charge one year and or one decade or one, two decades. <clears throat> we need to have sobriety that is ours, that we stay sober so that we learn Learning is attacked when you have an attack on sobriety. You can't learn. You can't learn because you're not sober. And that's that to me is what I've seen in the culture. Now, it isn't that uh, I'm a child of the 60s. I was born in 1949. But I saw that with our own generation. I don't think that's been curtailed. In, in, I'm still concerned about it because... I ended up making enough grades in school to get into a graduate level education. And I'm not trying to brag here, but you cannot learn difficult subjects in a professional career like medicine, which is what I'm in. And I'm worried about children not having that enough preaching. Uh, What do you mean by, what do you mean when you like the opposite of sobriety? Do you mean just like, um, no, no. Altered state of mind due to alcohol? Correct. Or other it's, things. You're not going to, your memory banks, you're not going to remember things. So if you try to study for an exam and you have alcohol or you have marijuana or you have, you know, or drugs that don't seem very Prescription uh, dangerous. Drugs. I mean, Adderall, it, that stuff. Really this, you really have to have, you have to be sober. You have to have sobriety. Sobriety is a virtue. Do you uh, draw the line somewhere? North of caffeine, or do you not like caffeine? I don't have a problem with caffeine. Okay, good. No, I mean, I've seen it. And I'm a pediatric lung specialist. I'm not an adult lung specialist where you have 30, 40 years of Well, whatever. I'm pretty childish, Yeah. so. Well. Uh, Dad's never been drunk. Well, that's that's true, but it also sounds like I'm sanctimonious, and I, it, that's not true. I just said, I've got to study Physics. I've got to study biochemistry. I, I can't have a lack of being I've never, sober. I've never been drunk either. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't. I just, I, have I just haven't. And I, I, you know, and I've got Irish ancestry, and I've heard all this. You know, this. Well, Irish people they drink too much. There are a lot of people that drink too much. Uh, it can start mild, but I think that's the problem with you're young. And you're around it, and it's easy to misjudge it because you're not going to retain knowledge that you've studied for. It's going to wash away or it's going to get partially uh, uh, remembered. That's what I see the culture in danger of because there are people around the United States that are not in the United States, even probably some that are here, that want to take this place down. It's not going to happen because we've got toughness. This is multifactorial, multicultural, and the United States is the best. It just is. Uh, there are smart places. There are smart countries. 
like there's nothing. Look at how much we rescued World War One, World War Two, Spanish. Look at that. Well, what about you know? You can argue. I don't disagree with that. But we need to keep sobriety, which means being sober, as a as, and the children have got to hear that. If they don't hear it, they think you're cool. If you want to stay inebriated, which means drunk, you're not going to learn knowledge. If it's hard to put it in your brain because it's a difficult subject, you're going to have a hard time remembering it if you're not sober. I like that. That's a um, It's simple. I personally have not ever drank, and my dad didn't drink much at all. Like, I can remember him maybe having margaritas like five times in my life. And uh, so I just, I never started. And, um, but I, I mean, I don't talk about it often at all, but I, uh, I, I like that thought process. And it's something you don't hear often, but it's also something like a lot of people are afraid to talk about you know, just because of like what you said, you know, like there's, they, they, they might think that you're judging them, but, um, but I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's simple that it does kill brain cells. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good advice. What do you have, Will? Don't let anybody tell you what to do and how to do it. If you, if you have a, <laughs> like your father, <laughs> if you have, well, I'm talking, I'm not talking about with sobriety. I need uh, to- that's a very a very valid point, and I, I did not follow it in my father's footsteps, but I do. I've I've never done a drug, and I'm proud of that. And it's uh, yeah. I've never smoked pot ever, and um and I'm I'm proud of that for myself because it's been difficult to say no all these years and how much I'm around it. I mean, it's on my bus in the green room. It's everywhere. I'm around it all the time, you know. And it's taken it's taken a lot, but I, the the alcohol I've definitely dabbled in. Um, my last me yeah, life advice is be like man. If you believe in it and like the people out there telling you can't or you you shouldn't are look at look at their lives and is that a life that you want you know yeah it's all the people that I know that are the most successful especially in the business that I'm in have been the ones that worked the hardest and 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 were adamant about put their nose down their blinders on and just went for it and it doesn't it doesn't guarantee success yeah it never does but to me the the hardest working sincere people uh seem to be the most successful in the business that i'm in and um and talent is definitely a, a factor but um I, I just know there's there's people more talented than me sing better that don't have my work ethic and i think um i think it's i think everything is doable and within reach i think you, you set your own barriers on that so it's my life advice tanaka what you got tanaka just uh i think when y'all need to be better persons uh Better dads, better moms, brothers, sisters, you know. Yeah. I think we just got to talk to each other more and, you know, just communicate. Yes, sir. Communicate. That's about it. Uh, my life advice would be it's okay to give up sometimes. Yeah, I definitely understand that. It's because some people, some people try things and they think just because they started it that they can't give up. And that if they stopped doing it, they would be a quitter. For instance, it was okay that you quit a feed yard job. You know what I mean? I just see people come in and they're like, I want to try bull riding. And then they make a conscious decision. or they, they Maybe it's not conscious, subconscious maybe, that they don't want to do it anymore. But they'll like continue to get on because they also don't want to be a quitter. And uh, it's okay to quit something. Yeah. You know, Donnie quit riding bulls so he could start riding Bronx. You know, that bull riding was his feed yard. And uh, I had another intern that had been trying bull riding, had some injuries, and had a conversation with him. And it was like, he w- it was tough for him. But I was like, dude, you ain't got to ride bulls. Like, and um, a lot of people worry about what people around them think about them quitting. But I mean, <clears throat> It's one thing if you're passionate about it and, you know, you're just having a bad day because you've had some setbacks. There's there's situations there where you don't need to quit. But it's another thing if, like, you know in your heart of hearts you don't want to do this anymore. You know, like, it's okay to quit working at a feed yard if you know that. So, 
anyhow, I, I think there's a lot of situations where certain people need to, to know that it's okay to quit. But yeah, that's just me. It's random advice from Dale Brisby only because I've had a few conversations with individuals over the last month that um, have made me think about that. Well, and also on the, the antithesis to that point is if someone tells you you should quit doesn't mean you need to. You yeah, know? for I, sure. And that's and that's something like, you know, that's that's important knowledge too for someone to know. It's like if you have a family member or some I can't tell you how many times dad got me try to get me to quit. Um get a real job. Yeah, well, I mean, it just he didn't want to see me suffer. It came from a good place. Right. But uh, you 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 know your limitations as a person. You know what your your cutoff points are and you reach those. And once you reach those, you can make a decision, but yeah, just don't listen to people. I mean, dude, it's, we're lo- like Dad said, this is the greatest country. We're such there's so many opportunities here, and uh, and uh, yeah, I just well, I try to talk people out of this, like bareback, saddle bronc, bull riding, bullfighting, like they're very dangerous, and like I will, um, you literally just I will ask me if I wanted to bullfight, and I said no, and you're you're gonna do it. Yeah, but uh, the kind of bull I'm talking about. <laughs> like, that was literally 30 minutes ago. Yeah, but you're different. <laughs> I'm saying, like, you're, you're when different. interns come here, like, if I can talk you out of it, then then we'll, you know what I mean? Like, just because <laughs> because it's such a dangerous endeavor, like, you could you could die. And so yeah, you can. I don't have any remorse trying to talk somebody out of it. And then once I realize that they're not going to be talked out of it, all right, I'm going to help you. Yeah, I'm not only going to help you, but I'm going to like cheer for you. I'm going to buy a certain bull that will help you practice better. We're going to go. Matter of fact, this afternoon, today, after lunch, we're going to go buck stock while you're on the clock. So I'm going to pay you to practice. So like yeah. once we do get, get engaged in this thing, I'm going to move forward with you. But prior to, I'm going to try to talk you out of it because yeah. it's that dangerous. So um, but well, you're, you're it, right. It, I mean, it's... It's it's intimidating. Those, those, I, I don't I don't have the guts, the want to, in, for anything rodeo, and for that matter. I don't even I don't care about horses at all. Well, at you'll all. you'll enjoy today. One. Don't worry, yeah. it's gonna be good. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. Dalebrisby dot com. Check it out as well as Cotton Fest, um, April nineteen twenty twenty one. Cotton Fest dot com. Cotton Fest Lubbock. Cotton Fest LBK dot com. Get all the information from our socials as well, and um, yeah, it's, it's a it's a really good time place place too that you uh, you can bring your kids to. Too, and look so. up the hit song from William Clark Green, "Wagon Wheel." <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll edit that out. Don't worry. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> pow pow. Thanks, Dad, for being here. Oh, I, I enjoyed it. Fun. I'm very impressed with the professionalism. You didn't even tell us about Lorenzo De Zavala. I would like to tell you. <laughs> Cut. Cut. Where are we? Uh, First vice president of Texas. First vice president. Not the president. <laughs>